Welcome back, everybody, to the A Little Less Fear podcast. Today, I would love to welcome Dr. Kelly Bonhoff. Amidst the world's current trauma, Dr. Kelly Bonhoff stands as an empathetic guide with a history of childhood adversity and sex trafficking, coupled with over 35 years of expertise as a registered nurse, licensed marriage and family therapist, and co-founder of Josephine's Clinic, a nonprofit serving those who have experienced human trafficking and violence, she unveils her own spiritual awakening. In her new book, What's Going On With My Family, A Roadmap to Healing Trauma, Unlocking Your Hidden Power and Remembering What is Sacred, Dr. Kelly unveils the dormant power and sacred nature within every traumatized family waiting to be rediscovered. Welcome, Kelly, to, Dr. Kelly, to the Little Less Fear podcast. Dr. Lino, what a joy it is to be here. I'm so <laughs> excited to get into this with you and just see where it takes us. So much beautiful energy in life. And so where do you think we should start? Well, I mean, your book is just loaded with information and I'm more than certain I'm going to have to invite you back because there's just so much. I mean, some of the chapters in here that really caught my eye. I mean, what's up with the drama and family trauma, uh, exploring the wisdom body, understanding the merry-go-round of survival, embracing the sacred nature of family, awakening the sacred nature in us all one moment at a time. It's really incredible. But before before we get started, I'm really curious, what brought you to your current journey? Tell us your true story. Yeah, boy. So uh, my parents, uh, myself as the oldest, and three siblings parachuted in as we planned. And so this is an important part of the true story is we had pre-planned to come in together as a soul family. And this was in our first merry-go-round, as it were, as it related to coming into this beautiful earth realm. When we landed, though, in my experience as the oldest of the four children, I knew immediately that we were in some kind of energy field. I call it in the book, the shark tank of energy, where I felt as if I was surrounded in kind of this fear, this heavy energy, heavy oppressive energy. And I realized very, very early in my life, it's very, it's one of the first look through, uh, through the looking glass stories I tell of finding my mother on the ground unconscious as I crawled toward her. And so as I grew up a little bit, I noticed I had three important jobs. The first was to keep my mother healthy. The second was to keep my father happy. And the third was to keep my siblings safe. So as you can imagine, as a little girl, the oldest, I was parentified very, very young and not remembering because we all drop in here to through the veil of forgetfulness. So one of the things we wanted to explore was I wonder what choices we'll make in certain kinds of family constellations, combinations and configurations. So when my parents um, began to date and they married at age 19. Well, you see, they weren't awake. They didn't remember their sacred nature, neither did their parents or generations upon generations before them. So I landed very honestly in the shark tank of energy. And so in the first seven years of life, what we know scientifically is that the child's brain and developmentally, we're just kind of looking around trying to make sure that we're going to survive this rodeo that we're yeah. in. We're trying to make sure. And so our brain waves and our ability, see, we're taking in everyone's beliefs and everyone's energy and everyone's ideas. And so at that time, uh, from conception in my mind, I believe that it's when we start our journey uh, of forgetting and then the rest of the journey is about remembering. Well, how do we remember when we are in a state of fight or flight? Yeah. And so what I say uh, about the nervous system as a nurse, but also kind of jokingly now, is that my nervous system was nervous. <laughs> it was yeah. nervous all the time. And so with a head on a swivel, 
I really had a lot going on in my family. And so I say it in this way, in a very loving way, as I have been able to remember and and discover what was going on when we all landed here. So in our pre-planning very quickly, my father and I chose to explore the energy of narcissism and empath, which means that we had a lot of interesting dynamics there um, related to fear, related to frustration, related to control over this kind of thing. My mother and I decided we wanted to explore the energy of neglect and abandonment. And so these energies and dynamics between myself and my two parents uh, were what the three of us had chosen to explore, little did we know. Now, the other three siblings, of course, had their own journeys, which I'll talk about a little bit later to how to make sense of six people in a family going through uh, mental, emotional, physical, sexual trauma and adversity and violence in a home where the most important thing was to keep it a secret. And so we were holding all of this information in ourselves and all of the ancestral trauma and karma that we chose as this particular family to come in and heal. So that was kind of the first seven years. And because my brain and my body and my interbeingness kind of knew how to survive, um, in this particular environment of energy, but my, my body said, I got to go. So I dissociated from a very, very young age. So I couldn't really feel my body, but boy, was I a high functioning dissociative. And I was someone who would make sure that everyone around me was protected. So I'm a warrior at heart. Dr. Kelly, around- I, yeah. I have a question. Go ahead. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. So people no, listening- go ahead. People listening uh, for the first time, how could you describe dis- dissociating from your body? Oh, that's a great question. So dissociation is what happens. Let's go back one more step, shall we? I got sure. excited, Dr. Lino, sharing sure. my true story. <laughs> so let's go back a moment with what is trauma? Let's go back there for a second. So in my own personal experience, there's so many definitions of trauma, but here is what it means for me. Any shock or distress that enters our environment that causes such misalignment, imbalance, and a less connection to our spirit. So in other words, the shock wave causes our mind, body, and spirit to misalign, to become unbalanced. We do not have access anymore to our sacred essence, our worthiness. What is sacred? Worthy of unconditional love, devotion, and reverence. I and love so it. When, when we lose our sense of divine, sacred, loving divinity, when we're born, we lose track. We have a limited connection now. Dissociation is my mind went one way, and my body went another way. And in those moments where the shocks and distresses were occurring, which were many, so these micro traumas, so we were actually traumatized in my mind by life itself. That's what it was feeling like to me, that life was coming toward me. And I was in a minefield kind of trying to army crawl my way through the next moment right but it wasn't just about me it was about is my mother all right is my father happy are my children and i call them my children were my siblings safe and so as this dissociation allowed me to survive i began picking up those ideas that most of us do when we come in through this veil of forgetfulness forgetfulness which is i picked up the idea and i put it in my little pocket with my little hand i am unworthy I am unlovable. Mm -hmm. I am not enough because I certainly couldn't keep my mother healthy and I certainly couldn't keep my father happy. And what I noticed was I couldn't keep myself safe, much less my siblings. And so these ideas were not mine. They were my parents' ideas. They were the collective consciousness's ideas that I absorbed. Why? Because I'm an empath. And we all are very open and sensitive when we're created and born when we get here. So 
my idea is that in my recollection is the very first trauma that many of us face, although it can be at conception or in utero is coming through that birth canal. Mm -hmm. And that is no fun at all. That is not like a roller coaster ride at your favorite theme park. Right. Right. And so we already know that we are in for a ride when we land here and parachute in to explore what it means to be human. That's what we're doing. And we chose the families that we wanted to explore with because they would be this beautiful, I heard Regan say it in your previous podcast, the divine sandpaper that yeah. each of us would need in order to remember and awaken. Yeah. Because for me and my journey, I had to get to a point of so much pain in my body, mentally, emotionally, and physically, that I didn't know if I was going to survive. That's the energy of stubbornness for me was one that I danced with a lot in this sure. lifetime. I just was so stubborn and I didn't listen to the pain. And so I love stubbornness. I love the energy of stubbornness. And I love all the energy because it's all sacred, regardless of mm. what kind of energy it is. So let me just very quickly fast forward to okay. age 10 quickly, as this was one of the key points of the reasons why I parachuted into this particular expression of life sure. in this particular timeline and storyline. When I was 10, I was invited to an overnight and I was so excited because I could leave my house and I wouldn't be worried about anyone else. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't believe that I was invited. And when I entered that overnight, instead of listening to what I understand now is my inner guidance system, I walked through the door anyway, and I landed in energy that was even heavier and even deeper and even more violent and even more unspeakable than my home environment. And I was surrounded by the energy of trafficking. The family that I had walked into with my friend was a trafficking family. And I did not know. And I didn't pick up on it because I wasn't in my body. And you were, and you were 10 years old at the time. 10 years old. And so what most traffickers do is there is force, fraud, and coercion. The fraud part is an interesting one. They tell you how beautiful you are, how much they'll love you more than anyone else, right? Mm -hmm. And then when that doesn't work, because I didn't buy that. So the only way that they ever got me to do anything was when they threatened my friends and my family. And then I knew that there was nothing I could do Mm -hmm. but survive the experience of it itself. Through that process, it went on 10 years, 10, 11, and 12. And when we were in school, the girls who were what I call caught in that energy field with me, little did I know at that time that we had chosen to explore that energy, to heal that energy, which I'll talk about in a little while, yes. is that when we were in school, we would, as I reflect now, we would huddle together in a pack because we knew that no one else could hear or understand but us. So we held this very tense secret. But there was also these things happening to our physical body as young girls. And with that came a lot of shame sure. and a lot of self-hatred and a lot of overwhelm. And if we had not moved from the area, I really don't know what the outcome of that for myself would have been because it wasn't that long after that I started drinking mm -hmm. and that I started doing very impulsive things because I, I believe a part of me wanted to exit stage left for sure. And in fact, that came up many times in my teenage years okay. because I couldn't figure out in my life story what I had done. Um, I was uh, raised in a Southern Baptist religion. And so I knew for sure I couldn't, I would not be going to heaven. That was a belief that I had. And why was that a belief that you had? The Southern Baptist church in the religious uh, doctrine, although I could be saved by the baptism and, and um, agreeing that Jesus is my Lord and savior. Uh-huh. 
there was something, and I did do that, by the way, because I wanted a chance to go to heaven. Sure. <laughs> but I think a part of me, the deepest part, the, the part that was the most devastated and destroyed of my personality, didn't believe that even Jesus could save me. I see. And so I limped along. And I remember thinking many times, I was too tired to live, but I was too afraid to die. Mm -hmm. And I stayed in that space for a very long time. And the addictions were helpful to keep me on the earth. And I am so grateful to the addictions. I'm grateful for the ideas that I had that were not mine, that I could finally navigate and understand in a way that as my own spiritual awaken awakening unfolded, that this book could come into the world because I ended up finding out that I am something called a blueprinter. I'm a map maker. Wow, I'm someone, that's amazing. I'm someone who's been in, on the earth almost a thousand lifetimes to wow. try and figure out how to help families navigate and transform fear into freedom. And had I, I not had every one of those experiences, had I not chosen to navigate these energies and to survive them in any way I could, you and I would not be having this conversation and we would not be able to share the freedom that we feel in life every day as the explorer, explorers that we are, we are explorers. We are on a sacred odyssey of creativity yeah. and creation and compassion. And I just want listeners to know that no matter what energy you've chosen to explore in this lifetime with whoever it is and whoever has played the villain in your story, whether it's a parent, a trafficker, you name it, fill in the blank. We are all here to recognize that within each of us is a villain, is a victim, but most of all, we are volunteers here having an experience where love is the medicine. So take heart, this. take heart and know if you can hear and just feel the resonance of my voice that even though the concepts and the ideas may feel a little overwhelming to you, your nervous system has been nervous your whole life. And that is natural. You are going through a natural part of evolution and there is nothing wrong with you or your family. You are heroes. The hero's journey is honoring the energy of remembered oneness. And we all came here to heal, unlock our hidden power, and remember what is sacred. I love this. Something I'm I'm wondering here, and I'm just thinking about um, where if somebody's listening to this for the first time and they hear your story, and somebody's also going through their own thing, whatever the thing might be, how does somebody come to be and understanding and and really feel that we are all volunteers how does somebody how can somebody say because uh i mean if, if i were to if if i were to listen to this podcast before i became on my awakening journey just 10 12 years ago i'd say how the heck did i volunteer to have my urinary bladder pulled out i don't understand this how did i volunteer to have 40 50 surgeries that doesn't make sense to me like i I, I love life. I don't want any of this pain. I mean, how does someone even start to begin to, to just take a chip off that doubt and try to at least have some type of feeling of understanding that we volunteered? It's, it's two words. I wonder. I wonder. I wonder if I'm a volunteer. I wonder if I'm pure love in action. I wonder if I'm infinite intelligence, pure love and sacred energy here to heal and remember my own sacred nature, but also in doing so become a wireless Wi-Fi. 
broadcasting love instead of fear. That is the hero's journey. So for me, it started with asking different questions instead of why me, Mm -hmm. why this, why these parents, why this situation? I went into this because I had no choice. I was on my face, literally. I mean, I, I couldn't move. I was in so much pain, hadn't listened to my body. I was 57 years old at that time. And I surrendered in that moment. I remember thinking, if there is any way that I can understand this, please help me. And then I heard, I wonder. And I thought, okay, I wonder. And then I just started writing questions. I wonder. And from there, because I'm a scientist and I didn't believe in what I couldn't see or feel, I had to learn to feel again. That was a very important part of it for me to feel these subtle energies of love and higher guidance. I had to get my body healed in order to get and to feel the subtle vibrations. But it started with those two words. I wonder if it's possible that my family and I planned this. I wonder if it's possible that I'm more than I could have ever imagined. I wonder if I'm more courageous than I ever thought I was. I wonder if the pain will ever end. I wonder. And it's in that compassionate inquiry where the door to self-love began to inch its way open. And then the synchronies, synchronicities and the, I asked to be shown specifically by my higher guidance and my higher self, if this is real, you'll have to show me because I don't believe it. I believe it. I'm not a stranger to the dark. And in fact, I prefer the darkness because at least there, I know how to defend myself. What I realized was fear was the familiar energy aligned with resistance. Aligned with what? I'm sorry. Aligned with resistance. Okay. So if we think of ourselves and our families as energy, it's familiar energy aligned with resistance. So I take it out of my mental intellect and I put it into the quantum physics realm or the energy realm, everything is energy. So now if I speak in terms of familiar energy aligned with resistance, well, what am I resisting? I'm resisting love, higher guidance, friends and family in the galactic and celestial realms. Why would I resist that? So I ask the question, I wonder why I would resist love, joy, freedom, hope, fulfillment, happiness, why would I resist the things that I think I'm looking for? I think I'm begging for, I think I had prayed for to someone about something. I would just love to take a breath without pain. Sure. And so I started with, I wonder, and I realized Plato's cave came into my vision, the allegory of Plato's cave, where we're in the cave and we're watching the shadows on the wall. And we believe those to be what's true about money and health and relationships and technology and social media and all of our distraction and our focus is on the shadows on the wall. And those are the illusions. But someone gets up and says, I want some popcorn. So they don't want to stay in the show. They start to look around and they see light behind them. And they're saying, wait a minute, is this projection on the wall? And where's the popcorn? I'm getting hungry. So they start to walk. <laughs> they go up the steps. But the, once they get to the steps, what do they see? This bright light. And because they've been in the dark the whole time, they're afraid to walk into this bright light, which is love, right? Right. And so what is it that humanity is learning again, remembering again, discovering again? Well, it's to allow love to be a part of their lives and then to remember, oh yeah, I actually am love in action. Right. 
we were resisting love for the one for the, one of the deepest wounds that humanity is healing right now and, and it is the, the wound that is i am unworthy of love mm -hmm. and the why fear, is that have you have you asked have you wondered why that has been one of humanity's biggest uh, i guess biggest struggle well from the human perspective the genetics of humanity for hundreds of thousands of years were genetically predisposed to survival. So our nervous systems are nervous. So we have genetic and energetic imprints, right? So we yes. are a unique and universal expression of life. So we have genetics and epigenetics, which are kind of running our show until we turn those off. So if you, if you have cancer running in your family or heart disease, which is running in my family, mm -hmm. then we have in our minds, well, it's running in our family. Chances are good. I'm going to get it right. That's a belief. That's a chronic way of thinking. We go to the doctors, we get our medication, we take our blood pressure and we just wait for the heart attack, right? We just kind of yeah. almost self-fulfilling prophecy our way in. So what I realized in the epigenetic is Bruce Lipton's work is once you realize, oh, I can turn off those markers anytime I want. Yes. If my family <laughs> is, is suffering from cancer for 15 generations of wherever. Well, the energy echo of that particular situation, whether it's cancer or heart disease or whatever it is, you just say, oh, well, that echo is going to start stop with me. So I, I do not prefer heart disease. I'm going to affirm that that won't be something I'm going to be involved in. And I'm not holding the energy of heart disease. Now I did have heart disease and I did have high blood pressure and I am completely clear of all of that. Now I spoke to my telomeres and I spoke to my cells and I spoke to my genetics and I said, Oh, okay. So I remember now I am the creator. I choose yeah. what my physiology is. I choose what my cells overhear me say in my mind. And so I chose to take myself out for a spin to see if what anyone was saying was, was this true or not for myself before I would ever say it to my family or anyone else. And lo and behold, as you have experienced personally, yeah. and as I've experienced personally, that is an actual thing that happens. And we are the walking miracles because I have no more pain, no more addictions, no more medications. And I am the version of me that is still walking toward uh, the highest version of love. So our families are not broken. They are becoming the greatest expression of love they have ever known. And some family members will awaken. And some family members said, hey, not this time around. And I think the woundedness of I am not worthy, which came in genetically, epigenetically, and through an imprint of humanity, we have been addicted to suffering for so long that we believe that that's all there is. Yeah, that's for so sure. So the addiction, the overarching addiction of all addictions is a suffering itself. Yes. So once I decided, I do not prefer to suffer. This is what suffering feels to me, looks like to me, sounds like to me, and what I am experienced. This is suffering. So I use two powerful words. I wonder. I love this. I love this, Dr. Kelly. I wonder. So then in wonder, do you still use the I wonder? all the time because it connects me closely to my inner child and my inner child that I was finally able to bring back together and integrate. I had a tremendous amount of soul loss in this lifetime. I had ripped through my aura. So I had no way to travel astrally and get any sleep. So, so for 57 years, I had no regeneration at all. Oof. And so many of us, because we don't hear about these things in kindergarten, we don't recognize we're energy beings of light that we're actually right now on the other side, we're asleep dreaming us. We are, we are a figment of our beautiful imaginations. 
which I think is so beautiful to think about. We're like Russian nesting dolls of dreams within dreams. And we are the dream weavers. And so if we have woven a dream where generations of our families have explored the energy of violence and abuse and neglect and suicide and homicide and trafficking and all of these very heavier energies, one of the things that has kept humanity stuck is judging that energy. In other words, one of the greatest healing moments I had because I asked the question, I wonder for the villains in my trafficking story, mm -hmm. did we have a pre-planning meeting? And I asked to, in I asked my higher self if I could meet with their higher selves mm -hmm. to see what the plan had been, or if there was a plan, or if this was a bunch of what I call BS, belief system. So I had to own my BS, right? My belief system. <laughs> and I was navigating it along the way. And I'm saying, sorry, but that's just really, that's brilliant. Your BS is your belief system. <laughs> I'm navigating my BS and I'm owning my own shift, which is yeah. sacred, sacred healing of individual and family trauma. That's the other thing. Acronyms for some reason come through. The shift is the sacred healing of individual and family trauma shift. Love so it. I own my own shift and I take responsibility responsibility for my own BS because I am the director and the script writer and I did the costume designs and I did hire the actors. And so there is no one to look at and blame for anything. And that includes me because guess what, everyone, you beautiful, brilliant and brave souls of this earth came in and the thing that you're experiencing right now, the thing that has brought you to your knees, the thing that has created the sense of unworthiness in you, you hold the potential as you ask the question, I wonder, as you move through and integrate and alchemize and heal, you may not know this, so I'll tell you a secret. You hold the healing keys for that energy. Yes. So I hold the healing keys since I am now awake, alert, oriented, I have remembered everywhere I go, I hold a healing key energetically. So if I'm in the grocery store or sitting at a table in a restaurant, and if someone has had a similar experience to my own, that energetic healing key enters into their subconscious unconscious system. And they have now the possibility you mean simply because the they direction. came through, they connected with your aura, your all intermingle. The yes. Right. So they inter inter like a Wi-Fi, like a Wi-Fi. So okay. the intermingling of those healing keys. So we're not just vibrating fear. We're vibrating freedom. We're That's not just vibrating chaos. We're vibrating mm -hmm. clarity. So this so makes sense. Works. Dr. Yeah. Kelly, the reason why this makes sense is because if somebody's depressed all the time and then you start hanging out with people, they start to feel depressed around you. It's kind of the same concept. So if you're in this awakened state of uh, clarity and and you giving yourself this opportunity to use your own keys to heal yourself and you're walking around feeling good, feeling the joy of the healing that you've created and you've because of your own taking control of your BS, your belief system. Yep. You're radiating this new belief system. Your aura has has new clarity. And in people yes. come commingling with you, it's almost as if the way that a disease can be contagious is the way that this joy and this higher vibration can be contagious to them, even if they're not aware of it. Yeah. So, you know, uh, Dr. Lino, you and I have heard, and I'm sure many have, this idea of emotional contagion, right? So I call this energetic illumination. Oh, <laughs> Illuminosity. Wow. <laughs> energetic illumination the lighter you are you walk into a room and everybody is authentically joyful not because they've had a few drinks and some taco <laughs> salad and have watched the game but because you know you, you just you're, you're like whoa what is what is going on and on the other side of exploration when spicy words are flying and you're passionately animated you hit the doorway of a home or a car or someone is in in wherever you can feel the energy. Something has just happened. 
right? You can right. feel the heaviness of it. So it's the same, excuse me, it's the same thing. It's just in its opposite spectrum. So from fear to love. So we're just exploring, we're explorers of the energy spectrum of fear to love. And once we realize, oh, what do I prefer? Well, then this is where everyone starts to go, but I don't have enough money. Mm -hmm. I, my husband, wife, romantic partner, boss, daughter, son, friend, they're never going to, that's never, that's never going to fly. That's, they're just not going to do it. And so that's when I start again, because my whole life had been living outside in and upside down. So yeah. <laughs> because now I want to live inside out, right? Yes. And upright. So <laughs> everything external to me is the mirror. And once I realized every person in my life was a mirror to my inner world, I started to, and when my husband and I were getting spicy words and passionately animated, we had some healing between us because we also came in. We also had had a plan for our marriage to come in. We had been together many times and hadn't made it. So this time we said, I think we're going to make it this time. And we, and we, so far we have every breath we take is a new breath, but for the inside out, upside down stuff, I realized Every time a, my ego, I love the energy of the ego. I hope we can talk about that. But the ego would say, you know, my husband's name is Bill. You know, he really wants to go have Mexican food. And I'm saying, well, but I don't really want to go for the seventh day in a row. But I don't want to make a ripple. I don't want to make a ripple. Right? Right. So what I learned to say was, I wonder if I said what I thought. I wonder if I said what I really felt. I wonder what would happen. So the moment I took my inner power, I started taking my inner power. Once I could feel, I said, Bill, I wonder if we could take a break from that and go here instead. And uh -huh. after 38 years of marriage, <laughs> this guy who is the love of my life, my, my twin flame, he says, well, of course, sure. all, all you had to do was ask what, <laughs> right? So that is part of the journey so far that I wanted to share with you what I've learned so far. And oh, to be free, Dr. Lino, to be free and to not be afraid all of the time is so magical. <clears throat> and it's all within us. It is all within us. I love this. And I feel your, your magic. I feel your joy. And I just feel in perfect alignment. I'm just really blessed that you're able to tell us your incredible true story and, and definitely motivate people is what we're doing that's what we're here for i have a question here so energy of the ego can we talk about this yes so again as i became uh more trusting because one of the things there are th let me let me go with let me go with the ego first and i'll tell you the three themes that humanity is healing so okay. we go from micro to macro okay. so ego Yes. So as I was uh, still recovering from all the stuff I was trying to detox my body from, I had to lay around a lot. I wasn't able to move a lot. And, and so I listened to channel messages. I read just a ton of books and all of this kind of stuff. And I kept noticing that the ego is something that everybody was really having a hard time with. Or the language of the ego was like, in the spiritual community, was like, the ego is a villain. Like, we have to go through an ego death, for instance, this, this kind of language around, well, it's an ego death and the ego needs to step aside or it needs to be in the back or whatever all that is. Right. And so I decided to check in with ego, but the first thing I thought was, what is <laughs> ego? To, what is the ego to me? And I realized the ego, because as I've been integrating the other parallel versions of myself and my higher self, the integration of, of many things. So I've, I've got all these really interesting things, poetry. I've never written poetry before, but poetry is coming, but acronyms began to come through and ego is, and I don't use the word uh, God very easily for me because I'm still working on that word, but experiencing God as other ego or ego experiencing God as one. So when I checked in with my ego, you've, um, you probably have seen the uh, movie Inside Out. I haven't. 
oh, my friend, you're going <laughs> to need to go. You're going to need to go. So this may not make a lot of sense, but the okay. movie is this beautiful um, idea where this young girl has all of her in her mind. She has like a buffet of anger and sadness and joy and this, that, and the other. And so they do all the internal dialogue of how she's moving through her life. So I, I created that in my mind. Once my imagination came back online, when we're small and we hit the energy of the shark tank in that heavy fear, our imagination and creativity goes offline because in order to survive, if our imagination stayed online, then our imagination would take us to even darker places, right? Imagining yes. dad's coming in or kids are hurt or whatever it is. And so our imagination left the building until such time as I could uh, release the dense debris of energy in my body and have more light come in. And then I could imagine again in safety and security and trust that I could imagine. So I imagined it like this inside out movie that Pixar made. So I, every day, many, sometimes several times a day, I, I have everybody in a, at a round table with their favorite beverage and my mind, my human mind shows up my ego. And I ask my ego, so are you experiencing God as one? Do you feel like you're a part of the group or do you feel like you're out of the group? And when I did, I call it the ego diaries. I interviewed my mind. I interviewed my ego. I interviewed my body. I, I, love interviewed, this. <laughs> I interviewed my soul and I interviewed my, my spirit, my higher self, like the view, you know, like a daytime talk sure. show. <laughs> and I'm sitting there as Kelly, Dr. Kelly, as the human. And I'm like, mind, would you mind? <laughs> <laughs> explaining to me why you cannot calm down. Why are, what is 70,000 thoughts a day? What is happening for you right now? I wonder what's happening for you. And then I did that for the ego. What the ego said, Dr. Lino, the very first time I even asked the ego how it felt, what was going on with it. It's, I asked the ego for its story. And my beautiful ego said, because our egos are unique to the incarnation. So this ego will will go into uh the whole of my soul right uh, in my spirit when when this beautiful body dances into eternity die dances when i dance into the other side of awareness this particular ego integrates so this ego is my beautiful ego for just this this go round so i asked the ego um hey sister what's what's up like you know because there's a lot, you need a lot of validation. I'm seeing a lot of self-sabotage. Uh, you know, you're, you're just, or what, tell me what it is you are really here doing. And it said, I feel like you want to kill me. It said, because you're, you're reading all this stuff and you're wondering if the ego, if I need to go somewhere, or I need to be out of your life or whatever. And I remember writing in my journal, I was in tears. The ego said, the only thing I have ever wanted to do was to keep you safe. And wow. I was like, wow, well, why is, why is everyone so hard then on the ego then? Yeah, you know, right. Why is it that we feel like it needs to be uh, placed in the back seat or given a vacation or, you know, whatever. And so I chose in that moment to imagine and I do this just like I, I showed up once the fragments of my soul loss. I had several parts of my soul at different ages in different realms and spaces and places. And a shaman helped me to retrieve them. But once everyone was back in, as it were, <laughs> then I am devoted to my own well-being first. My mind, my ego, my body, my soul, my spirit. And I do a I do a check on my inner guidance system. How's everyone doing? And if any part of me is starting to show up and the nervous system is getting nervous, then all yeah. that means is I wonder what is ready to heal next because we're healing in layers upon layers of ancestral eons of trauma. Karma cause and effect is really nothing more of than how many Thoughts, words, beliefs, emotions, feelings, and actions did I make in fear versus how many thoughts, words, emotions, feelings, actions, beliefs, and did you make, did I make in freedom or oh. love? And so all we're doing, I'm a Libra. So we're balancing how many lifetimes, how many opportunities to choose love, but I chose fear. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I'm actually 
here to balance. So now I'm choosing in freedom. I'm choosing in love. I'm choosing in compassion. And the very first place I go is self-honoring. And this takes me to the three themes that humanity is healing. Now, for those who believe that we're going to heck in a handbasket, mm -hmm. what I want you to know, beloved, is that that is where you will go. Because if you believe that to be true, then all you will see around you is heck in a handbasket. And you know what? You may have said, for this ascension, I want to experience as much heck in a handbasket as I can. Because yeah. I have some things I want to learn. And by the way, I'm going to hold, I'm going to be the catalyst for what people may not prefer. So if you've got someone in any system that you're like, that person is wrong, that person is right. Well, that person actually may be this beautiful ascended master holding the villain position so that you can wake up. Sure. And that may be someone in your family doing that. So you can't know what the sacred contract and blueprint of your parents, your siblings, your romantic partner, or any of that is. It's very unique and complex. All you can do is focus on self-honoring, which is self-love, self-compassion, self-forgiveness, self-care, and self-trust. And once I knew that I was worthy of devotion and reverence and love, there was no stopping me. And so what is humanity actually doing right now? Or what we're in is the beautiful transition and co-creation of the bridge of light where separation, judgment are no longer a way of life. Where childhood adversity, we right. will look back and go, hey, what was that about? Oh, we were kind of learning about this heavy energy because the legacy of love for humanity to the galaxy and the universe earth's <laughs> universe is we have something human beings have something that no other species in all that is has do you know what that is is that the is that love is that the light of love i mean that's what created us right right so everybody's got that but guess what they don't have guess what they're trying to learn from us about compassion was in compassion love compassion is is a different energy so okay unconditional love is the highest but how do you have so this is what you and i were talking about dr lino yes. how do i can have compassion for the trafficker that abused me it's a great question how do i have compassion and forgiveness for a parent who beat me Yes. How do I have compassion and forgiveness for a mother who rarely held me or made eye contact with me? Mm -hmm. And I'm just talking about my own lived experience. What I discovered was what I was feeling was the light in my parents. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I was confused by their behavior. So I was, that's why I became a nurse and a therapist and have done trauma and families all over the place and been to Nicaragua, I've been trying to figure out how do families navigate compassion? Because I've heard so many people say, I will never forgive dot, dot, oh, dot. So have I. I've heard that so many times. Or and so, I, where, yeah, where uh, do you get, yeah, yeah where do exactly. you get the compassion? So compassion is the human spirit. And why do we have compassion? Why is it that we've got this energy? It's because we dove deep into suffering. We chose to explore the energies across a spectrum and many species in the galaxy are like, Ooh, that's kind of rough down there in the 3d earth. I'm sorry. Did you? And yet we won the lottery because there are many, many souls that really want to have this experience because we grow exponentially at the soul level. Sure. So that's what humanity is actually doing. We're coming into remembrance. And so as we walk around, heal ourselves first, you're first, oxygen mask on first, right. you're first, and then from the overflow. And you know, it's interesting in healing uh, this idea within my own family, because I'm just now, the book has just come out, I'm about to start a YouTube channel, and I've got a library that's going to come into the world, but I had to figure out, well, in my own family, how does this work? Where I and my husband's family, and then across 
across both our families that were highly traumatized. We we chose a lot of ancestral trauma and karma to clear and alchemize in this lifetime. And I decided I wouldn't say a word to anyone, no member of my family, no member of his family. And I, Bill was kind of figuring out something was going on with me, but I really didn't talk to him about it. And I waited to see if the energy, if the, my shift in vibration to see as a scientist, if I observed anything without anyone having a conceptual conversation with me about it. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you a spiritual person now? Or are you just, what, right. are, you, what are you doing or whatever? And so I decided uh, to, to do something I was terrified to do, but I did it anyway. Uh, do you remember the Bee Gees song? You're pretty young. You're a little, I'm in my sixties now, but uh, Shadow Dancing. I love dancing. the Bee Gees though. <laughs> shadow Dancing. Yeah, you know, of course. We, we talk I love a, that song. <laughs> we talk a lot about shadow work and I'm like, that's right, a lot yeah. of work. I've worked on my life. I don't want it, the inner work. And that's why a lot of people don't do it. It's kind of the way that we're marketing it. So I decided to market it to myself differently. And I asked my higher guidance, can I please market this shadow work differently because I'm scaring myself. I'm gonna fake turn around and go back into my family of origin. And I'm going to do, do my best to, to hold as an observer and a compassionate witness to the energy that's flowing, not the person's hiss and spit, but the, but the energy. Can I, am I gonna be able to, to sit in a compassionate space and actually go back into the dynamic, into the environment? Yeah, that's and so excellent. I decided to, to visualize as I, my husband, and I always had a safe word going into our families, but, um, so I decided to, I'm going to call it shadow dancing <laughs> and the BGs would come into my mind. And so as I was doing my own inner dancing, I would ask any shadow that wanted to be healed. And I put the song on I and, love the this. and the shadow would come up to be healed because the shadow remember also has to have courage to come up to heal right. the shadow. I would ask the shadow, what is your story? What age are you? I wonder, I wonder why you're shadowy. Why are you in the dark over here? What is it that you were afraid of? And it was fear. It was this resistance. See, they were waiting. The shadows are waiting for me to love them. I had right. to find a way to love myself as Kelly, as an adult, to turn back toward those I had un unknowingly denied in order to survive. And so I, I shadow danced and then I, there, then they were still tentative. And so I'd say, can you tell me your story? And then I play the song. And the next thing I know, um, Dr. Lino, I started to see the shadow move and I decided there it is, there it is. And so all we would do is dance. I'm I'm going to tear up, but we would dance. The shadow would dance and I would dance. And eventually it, the shadow trusted me, the vessel, the technology of the body, the, 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 the wisdom of the body, this, this is the greatest technology known to man is the human body. And so it came and when it came, it just like a small child, I love children, like a small child, it just came into my heart and I held the shadow oh, and then beautiful. the shadow was gone. And so I encourage everyone to reimagine don't believe anything I or Dr. Lino is saying, go create your own way of navigating this incredible journey that we're all on. You are courageous, brilliant, brave, and beautiful. And all you have to do is just sit in the grass for 15 minutes and be still and just ask, I wonder, I wonder. And then your higher self and your guides, your sacred posse is what I call them. You're going to start to feel them. And then you'll see the angel numbers and then you'll hear the music and then you'll, <laughs> you'll wonder a little bit more. And so go back to the childlike wonder because that is your soul. And all it's ever wanted to do is play, to create and to love. That is your soul. And that's, that's, all, that's why they always say, go back to being childlike. Because when yes. you go back to being childlike, you get to create. And that's where the freedom's at. Yes. Dr. Kelly, I have a question, though. I mean, since before, I mean, what brought you to spirituality? Because, I mean, from the beginning of this interview, that, that's not your first seven years of life. I mean, well, it was it wasn't the my, opposite. So wasn't my, you... Yeah, it wasn't my first 57 years of life. Wow. It wasn't my first 57 
How and did so you come into alignment with your higher self? And was it other books that you read or other ideas that you saw that kind of just rang true to you and started to feel true for you? Well, in, in the book, uh, there is at the end, it's called Me, Myself, and I Am. <laughs> and that day, that particular uh that particular experience. So what happened was I was in so much pain. I, I, I was, I was desperate. I couldn't, I was getting injections in my back. I was gorked out on Percocet and Patron. I couldn't get, I couldn't get any relief at all. And so someone had said, go to acupuncture. And I went to acupuncture and that beautiful doctor put in 150 pins. When he took a look at me, he said, Oh no, 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 no. No, because he knew my life force energy, my, it was dim. He knew, he knew that I didn't want to stay. And so he, he put the pins where they needed to go. And it, after that very first treatment, and it was three times a week for weeks and weeks and weeks, he was trying to get those meridians to fire. And, but it was after that first one that my energy body flooded with debris and the cells in my body with all the trauma and the karma. And for the next 12 days, I really did think I was going to die because all of it came flooding in at the same time. And I just kept praying for help, even though I didn't know what I was praying to, what was going on. And I'm like, can someone show me anything at all? And that is when I had the dream. I had an out of body experience where I went to the realm where I was saturated in something I can't describe. It was love and compassion and freedom and connection and belonging. And it was so opposite to everything I had experienced on earth. And the voice said to me, this beautiful deep voice said, You have to know who you are not before you can know who you are. Oh, man, I love this. <laughs> and so I thought for sure I was having a psychotic episode because <laughs> it was so opposite. And one of my deepest fears was being taken to a psychiatric hospital. Um, and um, and so that was the that was the little bit of an opening. And then over time. Uh, I had guides who came to assist me with Reiki and shaman and QHHT hypnosis and know thyself. And so I began to know thyself. I began to purify my beautiful body so it could hold more light. And as it held more light, I began to have more vision. So I'm clairvoyant and clairsentient. Um, and now I'm writing um, poems. And I've been asked uh, actually, that's not true. I asked myself, I made a sacred promise to myself since we are creator. There's only one of us here. Okay. <laughs> there's only one of us here with 8.5 billion points of, of view and perspective. <laughs> but what I have remembered so far about my journey is that I've always been devoted and fascinated by families, even since the Lemurian and Atlantean times. And I always wondered how families echoed fear and how we could transmute that fear into freedom. So this has been something I've been doing forever. <laughs> and yeah. it's in this lifetime that I finally remembered. And I promised myself in this lifetime, because I needed all the other lifetimes in order to get all the gifts and abilities and remembrances online. And then to, to really have the trust and faith in my human mind and my human ego are now part of team harmony. And that's what I call us, team harmony. And everyone has a role and everyone has belonging. And since I've done that and I devote myself to their well being, which is my own well being, my wireless connection to, um, to all that is, it, it gets deeper and more beautiful every day. And so the visions and dreams are coming now in color. And um, it is a magical experience. So I can I, I cannot explain it. I can only I, I'm trying to explain it in words, but 
See, we're here to have a lived experience. And so everyone, it's experiential learning. So as we write our books and our poetry, what we're hoping to do is for people to feel the energy of the words and the conversation you are and I are having, and then do this beautiful thing. I felt something, I wonder. So we're just giving them a chance to remember. That's why we're here. I love this, Dr. Kelly Bonhoff, everyone, given the chance to remember is by asking yourself, I wonder. By doing that, you open up a path, a road to discovering your true self, your true nature, what's innate in all of us that already exists all at once. And we're opening those channels of communication thoroughly, beautifully, with a lot of light, warmth, and love and compassion. I love this. And that's Team Harmony. And I'm on Team, team Harmony. Harmony. You're on Team Harmony. So we have a collective consciousness that is Team Harmony attempting to remember and that is why we're seeing what we're seeing in the world, because as you and I know, coming through what I call, so I'm a recovering caterpillar. I went through the chrysalis where we all get liquefied and everybody's knowing thyself. Well, it's a messy, it's a messy, maddening, magical, miraculous, and mysterious business that we're all in. Sure. So for those of us who are awakened, we're just holding sacred space so that anyone who needs to hiss and spit on their way by we hold them without judgment to yes. whatever they need to do, because see that anger is as sacred as abundance is sacred. All energy is sacred. But when we start to do that duality polarity, I'm you know, we're in a, I hear the war, you know, we're in a war between darkness and light. Well, when I hear someone say that, that's fine. That's beautiful. That's where you are in your part of the journey, but right. you see darkness and light are made of love. Yeah. And so there is no duality at all. There's just oneness. There's just team harmony. And humanity <laughs> is integrating and alchemizing and remembering. And the solar flares and the Schumann resonance are assisting us. And because of the energy of stubbornness, some people will be going through that process with more pain than they may prefer. But it but it, with anyone who comes within my bandwidth or my uh, my energy field if they ask me Kelly how can I how can I go through this with more ease with more joy with more fulfillment I got to get this stuff out of me but how do I do that yeah there are three things that you can do so just like you were talking was it the Buddha that said something about suffering remind me what yes. you were saying just because you are suffering doesn't mean you have to be in pain and just because you are in pain doesn't mean you have to be suffering Right. So when you notice that you are suffering, you have a thought that is disempowering in any way or in judgment of yourself or anyone else. Yes. Take, take these three very simple steps. When we were in school, we heard that if someone was on fire, they were to stop, drop and roll. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. So I imagine this as stop, drop and be stop and be still. Drop into three breaths, deep breaths, and now be present in the messy, in the maddening, in the magical, in the mystery, in the miracle that is you. Allow it to be messy and just know that it's information. I had so much rage, Dr. Lino, that I... <laughs> Ended up, I was trying to figure out how to dispel that energy of rage that wasn't just mine, it was ancestral line. So I ended up boxing for one year and I ended up going to rage rooms. That's what worked for me. So I didn't judge the rage, although I was terrified of it, but I befriended it. And I said, what do you need? I wonder what do you need? And it said, I need to move. Show me what you mean. I need to move. How do you want to move? Let's go boxing, boxing. I'm a 60 year old woman. What am I doing in a <laughs> boxing ring? Whatever. Okay. So these are the little things that I just discovered, learned, imagined that I share with everyone because they're free. You can do them anywhere. You can do them anytime and they work. 
Dr. Kelly Bonhoff, everybody on a little less fear podcast. I wrote down so many goodies. Oh my goodness. So many incredible golden nuggets. Um, my goodness. So loving even stubbornness because it's sacred. All energy is sacred. Team har harmony. Make sure you ask yourself, I wonder, I wonder if I volunteered my life into this. I wonder if I'm love. I wonder if I'm here to remember. Remember to broadcast love, surrender, learn to feel again. Fear is familiar energy aligned with resistance. We are here to recognize that we are all volunteers where love is the medicine. Take control of your own BS, which is your belief system. Energy of the ego. Ego, is it either experiencing God as other or ego, is it experiencing God as one? Ego is the human mind, unique to incarnation. Stop, be still, drop three breaths, be present in the messing, uh, the maddening, the magical, the mystery that is you whenever you come into something stressful. Compassion is the human spirit. How do I have compassion and forgiveness? All you can do is focus on self-honoring, self-compassion, self-love. This has just been really incredible. Uh, I, so I have a poem to share with you, and I know you have a poem too. You too, okay. Would you like me to go first or do you want to go first? You go first and then I'll 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 end our session with uh, some real encouragement for those listeners out there uh, that to just sail them into the next greatest moment. Ooh, love this. Okay, thank you so much. So this poem here is dedicated to Dr. Kelly Bonhoff. And here it goes. In this, all that is, all that has ever been, and ever will be, is love. In this interconnected web that we weave, a sip of our favorite beverage is shared and remembered collectively, elevating consciousness to connect our hearts the way Mother Earth is connected to trees. I prance in excitement knowing that energy exists within me, you, us, and we. We are family, we are whole. And that's your energy that I felt. And it's really incredible because after this interview, it just feels ever so true. <laughs> right. So we manifest it and we feel it. So it's in the feeling. So uh, sometimes I say to feel or not to feel. That is the question. That right? is the question. And we, we run from our feelings. But remember, our feelings are just a, a storyline and a timeline and a world line that just wants to be loved heard and understood and the minute we get that and we just befriend our feelings dance with our shadows have fun be playful you will find that it's easier to move the energy that's heavier um, with through your body but also in the midst of your relationships and in the world so i wanted to share this with you, Thank you. Uh, the one sacred family poem when i look at your family what do i see when I look at your family, what do I see? The brightest of stars shining back at me. Their beauty, their brilliance, their bravery so clear. I marvel at the journey that brought them all here. The love that they hold a beacon so bright, our hearts intertwined, bathed in pure light. Yet shadows of fear sometimes darken their eyes, a hint of the sorrows they have tried to disguise. In their confusion, a mystery unfolds, a puzzle of secrets, of tales still untold. But still your family, steadfast and true, radiates a love that shines right through. When I look at your family, what do I see? The essence of hope gazing at me. In moments of silence, the truth is revealed the timeless love and deep wisdom their hearts have concealed. Their love transcends beyond earthly confines, a cosmic embrace where pure light shines, embracing their journey, their pain, and their tears, transforming their trauma, overcoming their fears. A testament of spirit, of love's gentle power, finding freedom and healing in each sacred hour. Your family's story, a beacon of grace, navigating through shadows, finding your pace. When I look at your family, 
what do I see? You are one sacred family, and you are already free. Wow, that was amazing. <laughs> That's really amazing. When did you write that? It it kind of downloaded about two months ago on a napkin. It started oh. at the top of it. When I look at your family, what do I see? And then it it just unfolded and I just kept writing and then it and then it manifested and then it came into when I look at your children and then when I look at myself and then when I look at my husband and then so it was this uh this unfolding of several points of view as it relates to relationships and this one to me is uh very powerful as it relates to our families our human families and what the world has to look for and uh, I do vision and have dreams where childhood adversity is no longer a way of life, where we will no longer echo fear, where only love exists and hold it because it's in the visions where we will co-create. We are co-creating. I actually live in heaven on earth right now. And yes, so you do. You. And thank you for sharing your heaven on earth here with me on a little less your podcast. Where can our viewers, our watchers and our listeners find you and your book? What's going on with my family? Well, for now, just go to one sacred and you'll see me there. We're going to move some things around. The YouTube channel will be starting and uh, I'll be taking the show on the road to help inspire families hold sacred space so that they can remember and awaken to their own sacred power. Dr. Kelly Bonhoff, everybody on a little less fear podcast. It's been a pleasure and an honor connecting with you. Thank you so much for sharing your grace and your incredible gratitude attitude. I love it. Thank you, Dr. Lino. It's been a joy.